As we move away from our announcements into our service, I invite you to stand with me as we read some verses for our call to prayer. I'm reading from Psalms, verse, uh, Psalms 105 and the first six verses. O oh, give thanks to the Lord, call upon his name, make known his deeds among the people. Sing to him, sing psalms to him, talk of all his wondrous works. Glory in his holy name, let the hearts of those rejoice who seek the Lord. Seek the Lord and his strength, seek his face evermore. Remember his marvelous works which he has done, his wonders and the judgments of his mouth. O seed of Abraham, his servant, you children of Jacob, his chosen ones. This morning, let's talk of his wondrous works as we praise him together. Our, please remain standing for opening hymn number 154, When I Survey the Wondrous Cross. us for being with us today. We invite your Holy Spirit to please 
be poured out upon each one of us. Let us set aside our thoughts and our fears and our concerns and our worries. We lay them down at your feet, Jesus, and we come to worship you. And we thank you for the gift of this day. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Worship and tithes and offerings, and before uh, the offering, we'll of course have a prayer, and then the children can collect the children's offering, which goes towards our, our Lewis County Adventist School uh, mortgage, and then the deacons will collect the regular offering. Uh, I wanted to also remind you, for those that might, might not be aware, that there is um, an option for online giving. We have been asked that from time to time. For some people, that's more convenient to do that. And there's a giving app that's very convenient to use. And so if that's a more convenient mode of giving for you and you're not sure about that, um, ask me afterwards and I, I can go over that with you. So some people have found that to be a convenient uh, way of giving tithes and offerings. So before we have our offering this morning, let's bow our heads in prayer. Our Father in heaven, we know that all that we have comes from you. And this morning we want to acknowledge that, that you're the source of all, of all. And as we give back to you this morning, we ask for, for cheerful hearts that we support the causes that are dear to you also. And so we ask for that this morning as we give back. In Jesus' name, amen. So children, if you'll get your baskets and collect the children's offering, please.
Last month we went on a mission trip to Peru. Do you guys know what a mission trip is? No, uh, what is it? What is a mission trip? <laughs> um, it's when you like go help and do stuff to show others about God. And so we went to Peru last month and we built a church and did VBS for them. It was hard for us to do that because everyone there spoke Spanish. But yeah, um, the church that we built, it wasn't as big as this church, but it was a really good church for them, and they really liked it. So, um. <laughs> um, do you guys want to be? Do you guys want to be like missionaries when you guys grow up? Yeah, uh, one way that you guys could help be missionaries is next July there's going to be a VBS and you could tell others about that and so that they can learn more about God. Okay, um, I'm supposed to hand these out. Uh, <laughs> I don't know what they are. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, then I'll just pray. Uh, dear Jesus, uh, thank you for today. Um, please help today to go pretty good and uh, that the VBS will go great next month, or two months. Uh, in Jesus' name, amen. amen. Good morning and happy Sabbath. As we get ready for our songs of praise, I have a, a scriptures, few scriptures that I'd like to read to you to begin. Revelation 4 tells us about the beautiful throne room of heaven, the beauty of God on the throne, and the different beings there. And I love that when we're in the presence of God, there is praise day and night, and the four living creatures are saying, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, who is and was and is to come. And in response to this praise, the elders fall down before him who sits on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever, and cast their crowns before the throne saying, you are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and by your will they exist and were created. So let's join in this praise as we sing, We Fall Down and Lay Our Crowns at the Feet of Jesus. We fall down, we lay our crowns at the feet of Jesus, the greatness of mercy and love at the feet of Jesus, and we We 
Revelation 5.16 continues and tells us of Jesus the Lamb, Jesus our Lamb of sacrifice, Jesus who died and rose again to rescue and save us from our sins and the evil of this world. Verse 6 says, And I looked, and behold, in the midst of the throne, and of the four living creatures, and in the midst of the elders, stood a Lamb as though it had been slain. Then he came and took the scroll out of the right hand of him who sat on the throne. Now when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb, each having a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song saying, you are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals for you were slain and have redeemed us to God by your blood out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation. The passage continues with, and every creature which is in heaven and on earth and under the earth and such as are in the sea and all that are in them, I heard saying, blessing and honor and glory and power be to him who sits on the throne and to the lamb forever and ever. Then the four living creatures said, Amen. And the 24 elders fell down and worshiped him who lives forever and ever. Friends, please join with us as we sing about our wonderful, merciful Savior. Falling before your throne. 
to our wonderful and merciful Savior, we praise God. May we, like Paul in Romans 1, 9, serve him with our whole heart in sharing the gospel of his Son. May our lives be a living witness to all those around us that the longer I serve him, the sweeter he grows. This will be our last song before the prayer. Since I started for the kingdom, since my life he controls, since I gave my heart to Jesus, the longer I serve him, the sweeter he Gracious, loving Heavenly Father, thank you for this nice Sabbath day, and I pray that you'll bless all the mothers this Mother's Day and always, and I pray that you'll be with all the ones that are sick and that couldn't be here, that you'll heal them and they can soon be back here. 
And I pray for the ones watching online that they'll get a Sabbath day blessing and pray that you'll be with our speaker, Mr. Johns. May the words not be his words, but your words, Lord. And may we go home feeling so blessed that we tell others about you. Now I pray that you'll go with us the rest of this Sabbath day and, and pray that the message that we hear, that we can know how to apply it to our lives. And now this is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 I serve him, the sweeter he grows.
much rather uh, listen to that all day than listen to a sermon any day. Well, good morning, and welcome to the Chehala Seventh-day Adventist Church. To our church family here, to our visitors, and anybody who's online, uh, welcome very much. Um, so we went somewhere on the slides. Okay, here we go. Uh, and of course, today we want to give a special welcome to all the mothers. To all the mothers here, because we're celebrating Mother's Day tomorrow, if you haven't forgotten, please remember. Last week, the service in the service, we talked about God's love. And so we want to spay, um, pay special honor and tribute to our mothers, because aren't they really the embodiment of God's love to us here on this earth. So happy Mother Day to all of our mothers. So this is a little strange for me. For the first time in my life, I find myself on this end of a sermon. Um, a little uncomfortable for me. I hope it's not uncomfortable for you. Uh, I hope it isn't for you, certainly. When Pastor Enrique asked me to speak, it was shortly after the time that Pastor Mutchler moved on to Texas. And so my heart was overcome with uh, sorrow, but I also felt sorry for Pastor Enrique wanting to have, or having to present a sermon every, every week. So my, my, um, my soft heart overcame my brain and it shouldn't have. <laughs> uh, let me assure you that preparing a sermon is far more difficult than restoring somebody's eyesight since this is also quite possibly the last time in my life that I have this opportunity, I wanted to at least present the one thing, the single most important thing that I thought we need to know. I've only got one shot at this. But first, a very major important disclaimer. The title of my talk in no way makes any claim or assertion that what I'm talking about or my thoughts rise to the level of the Gospels in the Bible, the four Gospels, the inspired Gospels. This is only meant to be a little bit punny, if you will. It is used as an introduction to my journey to find just what the Gospel is. Each of us is on a similar journey. We're having the same search, and each of our journeys is going to be a little bit different. But my prayer is that each of our journeys will all lead us to the same place and that's into the arms of a very loving savior. So this is my journey. It's been influenced by many people and I've been guided by many people and I wanna thank them for helping me on this journey and I wanna pay special thanks to our Sabbath school class whose wisdoms and thoughts were very important to me. But let's have a prayer before we begin. I really think I need one pretty bad. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be pleasing to you, O Lord, our rock and redeemer. So here is my question. What is the gospel? You've heard the text many times. It's so well known that it's been given the name, the Great Gospel Commission. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And then there's the second text. Very similar, and the good news about the kingdom will be preached throughout the whole world so that all nations will hear it, and then finally the end will come. The writers of the four gospels, the apostles, and Jesus himself talked about the gospel and the, king, the gospel of the kingdom. The four gospels all document the life of Jesus. It's an inspiring story. It's an amazing story. But just what is it about the life of Jesus that is so important? I wanted something that was simple, something that was concise, a precise definition of what the gospel is, and I couldn't find it. There are many allusions to it. There's many discourses about it. But I wanted a concise definition. So for a long time, I've wondered what it is, this wonderful good news that once it's spread to the whole world will result in the coming of the end. So my search begins. I've been rather fortunate 
in my life. For one thing, my very first choice was a very wise and very fortunate one. I chose the right parents. They were good Christian, loving parents. In fact, I think I'm a fifth generation Seventh-day Adventist. Seems like that would help in some way. Some of my very first memories were in the La Sierra College Church, where my father was an associate pastor while he taught in the religion department at the college. So much of my life then would revolve around religious studies and activities in a religion-related culture. My very first memory goes back to Sabbath school. What do you suppose that would be? You heard about it earlier. Jesus loves me. This I know. We heard it during the children's story or just before. Jesus loves me. This I know. And of course, as a small kid, that fact was impressed on me by my parents. They loved me, and to my simple mind, they were gods to me. My second early memory then was perhaps the most famous Bible text of all. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish but have eternal life. At this stage, my life was very simple. My theology was very simple. Jesus loves me. My religious learning expanded and started with some rather amazing stories, Bible stories. The story of creation. How? Could something come out of nothing? Noah and the flood, a worldwide flood, only eight people saved, and all of those animals pinned up inside of a boat. Wow. Abraham, the story of Abraham, faith so strong he would willingly kill his only son. The story of Joseph, so faithful to God in principle and rewarded, eventually saving the world from the famine. Then there was the escape of the children of Israel from Egypt, the parting of the Red Seas, the drowning of the Egyptian army, thunder and lightning on Mount Sinai, manna from heaven, water from a rock. Amazing stories. The, Daniel and his friends, the fiery furnace and the lion's den, such incredible faith and trust. And then there's the story of Jonah. Now, this is a real story, a whale of a story, if you will. The ooey, gooey mess inside of his stomach. Can you imagine? How did he breathe? What a coward. But God still had a mission for him. Then there's all the stories of Jesus. His miraculous birth, his life, his teachings, his miracles, and his death and resurrection, and of course, his ascension back to heaven. These stories were my early religious education. I learned them pretty much through the eyes of a child and took them pretty much at face value. They told me of an all-powerful God. They told me that I would be rewarded if I did what he said. But they also, most of these stories were of love, but they also had some that instilled a little bit of fear in me, a little bit of trepidation. I had to push these fears aside because I knew that Jesus loved me. As I grew older into academy and college, my religious training expanded further. It began to transition from stories and concrete examples of God's interactions to much more intellectual and philosophical concepts that brought much more meaning to these stories. I learned things like the Ten Commandments, God's rules for my life, particularly the Sabbath that kind of makes the Seventh-day Adventist Church unique in many ways. I learned about the state of the dead, the heavenly sanctuary, Christ, our high priest, sanctification, justification, righteousness by faith, and then there's perfection. What do we do with perfection? This was a real challenge. What am I going to do with this text? Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father, which is in heaven, is perfect. 
That's pretty tough. What about this quote from Ellen White? When the character of Christ shall be perfectly reproduced in his people, then he will come to claim them to his, as his own. These were hard things for me to understand. But then there's more. The Bible prophecies, particularly the book of Daniel and Re Revelation. Daniel 7.25, And he shall speak great words against the Most High, and shall wear out the saints of the Most High, and think to change times and laws, and they shall be given into his hand until a time and times, and the dividing of times. Or Daniel 8.14, Unto two thousand and three hundred days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. What is the sanctuary? What made it dirty that it needed cleansing? What's actually happening there? Is it really a physical sanctuary up in heaven that, earth, that the earthly sanctuary was modeled after? When's all this going to take place? And then the three angels' message. The first angel carried the everlasting good news to the entire world. Here it is, the gospel, the good news. What is that gospel? Angel number two announced that Babylon is fallen, is fallen. Who is Babylon? And angel number three announces that anyone worshiping the beast with his mark will drink of the wine of the wrath of God, tormented with fire and brimstone. What is this mark? Who's the beast? How will I know if I have the mark? And tormented with fire and brimstone? That's pretty scary. I have so many questions. If this was a revelation of God to me, what's wrong with me that I don't understand all of this? It seems so complicated. So I struggled with the answers. Whereas I was smart enough to memorize the answers that the teachers gave me in school and get good grades, these answers were not always satisfying. They didn't always make logical sense, at least to the amount of knowledge that I had at the time. Everything seemed so complicated. The greater my level of understanding, the greater the knowledge I had, the greater the complexity seemed to be, and the less I sometimes felt I really understood. Of course, my world was expanding outside the church, in the, outside the circles of religion, Early life was very simple. It was simply fun. My primary concern was what I do to entertain myself. Grade school brought some organization and discipline to my learning. Every year it expanded. Math expanded from addition and subtraction to algebra, geometry, and trigonometry. I even had to take a course in calculus as a pre-medical requirement. I passed, believe it or not. I, do, I could do the calculations through rote memorization, but I have no idea what the underlying principles were. Reading went from Dick, Jane, and Sally. I don't think Dick, Jane, and Sally are even around anymore. And they went on to simple stories, to the classics and literature. And then what do I very frequently feel is the unintelligible area of poetry. History expanded from my local family to the far ends of the world. Science and nature, they were always fascinating to me, starting from simple observations of the trees and the flowers and the birds and the animals and insects. But it got more and more complex when I started breaking things down, down to the cellular level, where we have the nucleus, ribosomes, mitochondria, and of course DNA and genetics. Then these are all broken down further into chemistry, in biochemistry. Now it's really, really getting complex. But then it got even more complex. Physics. All of the other things of nature that we see operate on some basic underlying principles of matter and energy and forces. Protons, neutrons, electrons, and then even subatomic particles six flavors of quarks, six kinds of leptons, 12-gauge bosons, hadrons, 
and billions of morons. So you are listening. Okay, good. <laughs> There's even antimatter. I don't have one iota of understanding of any of these things. These were on the small scale of things. But looking at the larger scale, look at the Milky Way. Think of the Milky Way. This single galaxy. 150,000 to 200,000 light years across between 100 and, two and 400 billion stars in the Milky Way. So what is a light year? The speed of light travels at 186,282 miles per second. Multiply that out, we get 670 million miles in an hour. Traveling for a full year, that's 6 trillion miles. That means 1.2 quintillion miles across the Milky Way. That's a number that is mind-blowing. But I did understand one, understand one thing that I saw. I couldn't understand it all. Oh, by the way, there are 100 to 200 billion galaxies. And guess what? They're still counting. Uh, but I did understand one thing that I saw, and that was I saw order. Um, everything comes together in an orderly manner and in a balanced system of interactions. Reading, math, science, all very fascinating, although they're very complex. But then there were things like ethics, sociology, psychology, the mysteries of the mind, matters of the spirit of man, the soul. Where did these things come from? What are they all about? Fascinating, but again, incredibly complex. All of this seems very overwhelming to me. There is so, so much to process. Consider this. In the year 1900, it was estimated that knowledge doubles every 100 years. By 1945, it was estimated every 25 years. Some estimates now put that at every 12 months. Knowledge doubles. I just read in one of my medical journals this, or two weeks ago, that it's now estimated that medical knowledge doubles every 72 days. If you extrapolate that forward, you're gonna come down to every 12 hours. And it's just amazing. I understood what Tony Bennett said when he said, the more I learn, the less I know. And I fully identified with the English romantic poet Percy Shelley when he wrote, the more we study, the more we discover our ignorance. And that's exactly how I was feeling. So out of this complexity, I needed simplicity. Well, what I was learning and experiencing was incredibly fascinating. It was also very overwhelming. So I started on this search for simplicity. In this search, I stumbled across a very neat quotation. This quotation is, if it can come up, very simple. Simplicity is the ultimate sophistication. I love that. It made good sense. And if it was good enough for somebody as smart as Leonardo da Vinci, that was good enough for me. And I came across another good quotation from another brilliant mind, Albert Einstein. If you can't explain it simply, you don't understand it enough. It made great sense. So this is the result of my search for simplicity in the matters of the spirit. First, I needed to know to establish the foundations of this life, of spiritual matters. Or is there such a foundation at all? I thought if I can discover this foundation, then I would have a lot of the other answers be available to me. So while as, whereas I always believed in God as a creator, it only made sense when I looked around me, 
I knew I couldn't prove that he was that he was in existence as I might prove a scientific hypothesis. So I looked for evidence, and for me that evidence came in one major area, and that is design. Very simply, when you look at all of the complexity of the entire universe, whether it's from the subatomic particles to the vastness of the universe all around us, and when you consider the physics, the chemistry, all of the precise forces that are constant and unchanging, it is an essentially impossible for me to believe that all of this came out through random chance. Let me give you one example of probability. What is the probability of a very simple functional protein, one with only 150 specific amino acids, evolving spontaneously in the right sequence and in the right structural spatial orientation, evolving spontaneously through random chance. If we take into account the estimated quantity of every atom in the entire universe, and if we consider the speed of chemical reactions, and if we were to even allow that this all started 14 billion years ago with the Big Bang, if you throw all of this into the computer, you come up with the chance of this happening on chance alone, one chance in 10 to the 164th power. What is that? 10 to the 164. Well, in comparison, if you were to consider the known universe, all of the protons in the known universe, they estimate that there's only 10 to the 80th. That's huge. So the probability of this coming together is even less. So what does this mean? It means the chance alone is not an option for our existence. Some outside force has been introduced to make it all happen. The complexity implies intelligent design, and for me, that's God. It is a far greater leap of faith to believe in evolution than it is in an intelligent designer. But then, even if the physical structures did come together somehow, how do you explain life, or the soul, or the spirit? It is way beyond our ability to understand, and I think that, once again, we are talking about something with an intelligent designer. I can't prove this scientifically, I believe that only God is probably able to prove his own existence. In contrary to what my dog thinks, I'm not God. So if there is a creator, and he created the physical universe using very precise rules or laws, the laws of physics and chemistry, there is every reason to believe he also created the spirit, laws of the spirit laws of the soul. And it would only make sense that following those spiritual laws would result in the best outcome of living, just like following the physical laws does. So now we want to know, what are these laws? Following our creation, these laws were passed on to Adam and Eve. They walked and they talked with God, and they found peace and they found harmony in the Garden of Eden. Everything was perfect. But then doubt was introduced into their minds by the serpent. They concluded, for whatever reason, that God's instructions res restricted their freedom. They concluded that they not, did not have to follow his rules for their life. They decided that they could do it better their way, and they did. They lost trust in God, and they did it their way and humanity has subsequently suffered immensely for their lack of trust in God and his ways. Peace and harmony were replaced by fear and conflict. And it got really bad, really, really bad. The fear was so bad, they thought they had to appease God. They created their own gods. They were fearsome gods to be very afraid of. They lost sight of a loving God 
It was so bad that God had to hit the reset button and hence the flood. But that was only a temporary fix. It became bad again. The people reinvented their gods. They reinvented their worship, their sacrifices. Some even denied that there were any gods at all. The fear, the mistrust, the conflict, the hatred only snowballed. With few exceptions, people lost sight of their creator and his true character. But God didn't want to give up. He didn't want to abandon his creation. But it seemed that every attempt at fixing this problem, every attempt at restoring a trusting relationship and eliminating the misunderstanding was, was uh, resulted in a problem still. It didn't solve it. Eventually, as this plays out, this story plays out, God knew that the only way to clear up all the misunderstanding, to restore this trusting relationship, was a direct revelation, a de direct demonstration, firsthand, in the first person, by God himself. We needed a firsthand demonstration of his character. We needed a demonstration that indeed he is fully trustworthy. The life of Christ is just that demonstration. His demonstration, his life is a demonstration of everything that is good. His death is a demonstration of everything that is evil. His death demonstrates the evil of selfishness, that a perfect being, the embodiment of love and grace, would subject themselves, excuse me, that they would be killed if selfishness was allowed to reign. But his death is also a clear demonstration of love. How is it even remotely possible for someone who is perfect, who is the embodiment of love and grace, that he would allow himself to be subjected to the indignities of selfishness, to the hatred of selfishness, to the cruelties of selfishness? It makes absolutely no sense at all, at least through our eyes. But if you look at it through God's eyes, it makes perfect sense because God is love and he doesn't want to give up on his creation. Through this love, through his life and death, he clearly demonstrated that, he, that we can fully trust him. As our creator, we can trust that he knows best. We can trust him and his principles of selfless love that are so clearly seen in his life and in his death. And this is good news. Actually, this is great news. I can actually trust God. I don't have to be afraid anymore. He's on my side. Even though I don't understand many things, I know for sure that he loves me, that he is trustworthy. And after thousands and thousands of years of lies and mistrust, this is great news. So now I can say with Job, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. Though he slay me, yet will I trust him. And I'm certain of this. So what is my response when I ponder this incredible demonstration of God's character, his love? We sang about it earlier. When I survey the wondrous cross on which the Prince of Glory died, love so amazing, so divine, demands my soul, my life, my all. So how should we respond? Jesus made it very, very simple. He said it this way, a lawyer spoke up. Sir, which is the most important command in the law of Moses? Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. This is the first and great, greatest commandment. The second is most important is similar, love your neighbor as much as you love yourself. And get this, this is an incredibly, part of this incredibly important part of this text. All all of the other commandments 
and all of the demands of the prophets stem from these two laws and are fulfilled if you obey them. This is the foundation, loving God and loving each other. It's really that simple.
Loving God and loving each other and making music with my friend, making music with my friends. It's really that simple. Remember the quotation from Leonardo da Vinci? Simplicity is the ultimate sophistication. I would contend that love is the ultimate sophistication. And the more I consider the cross, the more I survey the wondrous cross, the more I consider God's infinite love, the greater my love grows, swelling within me to overflowing in all that I do and touching the lives of all, all those around me. And we sang about this earlier, the longer I serve him, the sweeter he grows. The more that I love him, more love he bestows. Each day is like heaven, my heart overflows. The longer I serve him, the sweeter he grows. So now I seem to have come full circle. The first memory I had of Sabbath school was a child was, Jesus loves me, this I know. The first Bible text I learned was, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish but have eternal life. No, after exploring all the complexities of life, I still don't have all the answers. I still don't understand the Bible prophecies or sanctification or justification, let alone perfection. And life is still throwing me curveballs that I have to dodge. But I think I, I now know better and understand the gospel, this good news. And it's this, God is my creator. God's character is pure love, perfect love. He loves me with an infinite love and I can trust him. And I can trust him completely. Indeed, this is very good news, very good news. And indeed, it's very simple. I'd like to close a prayer. And this is the prayer from Paul in the his letter to the church at Ephesus. Shall we bow our heads? I pray that Christ will be more and more at home in your hearts, living within you as you trust in him. May your roots go down deep into the soil of God's marvelous love. And may you be able to feel and understand as all God's children should, how long, how wide, how deep, and how high his love really is. And to experience this love for yourselves. Though it is so great that you will never see the end of it or fully know or understand it. And so at last, you will be filled with God himself. Amen.